Hello, hello. As you might be able to tell from the fact how like I'm struggling to get this going, we're about to start. Um, first of all, welcome everyone. My name is Felix. I work at Slack. I'm on the desktop app team. Uh, thank you all so much for coming by. Uh, I want to start with a few housekeeping items. Um, first up, some bad news. Leo is currently sick. If you came here to see Leo from Zeit, bad news, he's not going to make it, which is very sad. So whatever you want to launch will apparently launch later. Surprise. Um, second housekeeping item thing, um, we do have a code of conduct. Please adhere to it, right? If anybody has any questions about it, it is both in the Electron repo as well as on the Meetup page. The third item is, um, if you're looking for restrooms, they're all the way to the back. You keep going until you hit the reception. And then um, what I would do is to just ask again, because it's complicated. But if you don't want to do that, you take a left and then go straight. Um, and now the most important thing for me personally, right, as someone who like works on the desktop app for Slack, if you feel like working on the desktop app for Slack, it's a fun endeavor, right? Um, so you might notice that all of you have these like yellow lanyards. If you feel like you hate your current job, or you know what, maybe you like your current job, but you still want to work for Slack. It's a pretty good team. We're nice people. Um, please talk to anyone who doesn't have a yellow tag. Could I just get like everyone from my team to quickly raise their hand? See how many people that is? We're like out in full force. Come and talk to us if you want to work on a desktop app. Um, many people like Slack, right? Um, OK, second item, um, we've got Jan here, which I'm very, very excited about. Um, mostly because Jan is famous for like tons of stuff, <laughs> which I have announced, so I'm not going to repeat it. Um, and I'm just going to give it over to her. Thank you. Great. Um, first, I have to make Chrome go to full screen. Do, do, do. Sorry about this. I think it's that. Great. Good UX. Um, so I don't know how Chrome works because I work at Brave. How many people here have heard of Brave or know what it is? Wow, that is a lot more than two years ago when we weren't a company yet. Um, so I'm, the, I'm a security engineer there, and today I'm going to be talking about building a secure web browser in Electron. Um, so the TLDR is you shouldn't try to do it. Uh, actually, I'm going to be talking about not building a secure web browser in Electron. Because uh, many of you have probably seen this quote. It is in the Electron documentation. Um, it basically says that when you use Electron, remember that it's not a web browser. JavaScript can access the file system, sh user shell more. Be aware that displaying arbitrary content is a severe security risk that Electron is not intended to handle. So TLDR is saying you should not load arbitrary remote content in Electron, hence you shouldn't build a web browser. Um, Electron wasn't designed to do that. But uh, I'm going to tell a cautionary tale about what happens when you try to build a web browser in Electron, which we did. So uh, a long, long time ago, around 2015, um, Brave, which is the company I work for, started building a web browser in Electron. And it didn't quite go as we expected. So why, why were we trying to do this in the first place? Uh, because browsing is fundamentally kind of broken, in our opinion. Ads are slow and invasive. Uh, they invade your privacy, et cetera. There is malware embedded in ads sometimes. So there's a security risk as well as a privacy risk. It, uh, it's expensive in terms of network costs. And if you want to block ads, which probably most people here do, you have to install these extensions to do it. And in response to ads sucking a lot, we've seen ad blockers grow more and more popular. So Brave is a new open source browser for all platforms, and it has privacy features like HTTPS everywhere enabled. Um, it has built-in ad tracker blocking, fingerprinting protection, et cetera. Um, as of a couple weeks ago, we've started working on integrating Tor in a private browsing mode. And most interestingly, we have a way for people to fund sites directly using anonymous micropayments. So basically, our vision of the web is in the future, instead of having to see ads, users can pay, uh, users can choose to pay sites directly through micropayments. And this is what it kind of looks like today. Um, so this is my actual browsing history in Brave 
converted into an amount of money that I should be paying each site, each site based on the amount of time I spend on it. Um, so the guardian.com has a check mark because they've actually signed up with us to receive their payments and I'll be paying them some amount of my five bat, which is currently worth two USD, but it changes a lot. Bat is a utility token that we use to denominate these payments. But anyway, that's all kind of just background on what Brave does and why we decided to build a browser. So after we decided to build a browser, why did we decide to use Electron? Um, first of all, it had really good cross-platform support. There was something called Graphene, I think, that was like the Mozilla equivalent of Electron, and it was embedding the Gecko rendering engine. But that didn't really support Windows. And so Electron was like the clear winner from that perspective. There was good documentation, great community. It was easy to develop on since we were all, we were all familiar with like JavaScript and React, et cetera. And best of all, there were already really great products using it, like Atom and Slack, Visual Studio Code, et cetera. So we did this. Uh, we first publicly released in early 2016. And only eight days later, we got our first really embarrassing security report. So some of you might already know what this is. Um, this is from Eric Lawrence from Chrome Security. And he pointed out that we are running without a sandbox. Hmm. This looks kind of bad, but how bad is it? So we tracked it down to this code in Electron, which appends the no sandbox switch uh, in order for Node to work in renderer processes. So at a high level, this is what Chrome's process model looks like. You have the main browser process, which runs at a high privilege level, and that communicates with these renderer processes that uh, that's actually what renders HTML and runs JavaScript and loads the DOM, et cetera. And the render processes in Chrome run at a lower privilege level. But that's not the case when you remove sandboxing. In fact, then pretty much everything runs at the same privilege level, which is high privilege. So why is that bad? Well, because the render sandbox is really useful. So the render, as you might imagine, has a pretty large attack surface because it loads all this remote content in a browser and it does JavaScript execution and HTML rendering, and it's taking in untrusted input all the time. But the main browser process, on the other hand, um, it requires high system privileges, like the ability to read from and write files, run commands, et cetera. You know, like if you allow webcam access, then it has to be able to access your webcam, et cetera. So if the render process ran at the same privilege level as the main browser process, then if an attacker has a render exploit, this would be a critical issue because they could basically do whatever the main browser process can do, which is pretty much take over your entire computer. And that's kind of bad news. So render exploits are not uncommon. Um, if you want, you can look up a competition called Pwn to Own. And in previous years, this has been a competition for people to develop an exploit, which just requires the user to load a remote web page. And from that, it can get you know, full root access on your system. And um, this is, you know, every year people win this contest, which shows that despite a lot of progress in browser security, um, these exploits are still very much possible. So why does Electron disable render sandboxing? Well, because as you probably know, a key feature of Electron is people want to use Node APIs from an HTML JavaScript page context. And, but as of 2016, um, ren sandboxing renders is available as an experimental feature. Has anyone actually tried using this feature in Electron? I think you set sandbox on web preferences or something like that. But yeah, see, it's just a handful of us, uh, many of whom work, seem to work for Slack. Uh, so if you want more details, uh, just look at the Electron docs. But going back a couple months in 2016, um, we decided not to wait for Electron. So we had our own fork of Electron where we enabled render sandboxing uh, for processes that don't need Node. And since then, we've sandboxed all render processes on all platforms. Um, and we have the slightly different architecture where our content scripts have this IPC uh, function that they can call to communicate with the main process, which has node access. So pretty much renders uh, don't have node access at all in Brave. 
And we also renamed our fork of electron to muon. So as you might know, a muon is like an electron, but heavier. And that kind of describes what muon the code is as well. Great, so things are going well. And then 11 days later, we get another really critical security report. And this is just saying Brave is insecure using an outdated version of Electron, uh, sorry, outdated version of Chromium. Uh, so we looked into this and as you might know, uh, Chromium, release, Chromium releases fix a lot of security issues. If you just go to any of their blog posts, they have, um, so these are just, just listing the ones that reported externally, not counting ones that were found by Chrome employees, but these giant lists of, you know, use after freeze, same origin bypass, et cetera. And keep in mind that if the sandbox is disabled, a lot of these high severity vulnerabilities get escalated to critical vulnerability because from the render, you can exploit the whole system. So that's bad news. And how urgent are these fixes? Well, according to Chrome security, they usually reveal these security bugs publicly within about 14 weeks of a fix landing on the Chromium source tree. Uh, Chrome's release cycle is six weeks. So once a Chrome stable release comes out, you have about eight to 14 weeks to update to the latest stable before these bugs become public and then anyone can start exploiting them. So that's a pretty narrow time window, um, about two to three months or so. And we move on because it renders a lot of remote content and we care a lot about keeping up to date with these security fixes. So we hired staff to do these rebases and we've been keeping to within one to two weeks of Chromium updates. And that's actually kind of, um, sometimes better than like what Opera or Vivaldi does. But that's not the end of the story. It turns out even when you're up to date and you have sandboxing enabled, you can still have security issues. I'm just gonna be talking about three of the more amusing ones we've found in the last couple of years since I started working at Brave. Uh, one is drag and drop privilege escalation. Pretty sure this still affects Electron in general. Uh, this is really funny. Uh, someone opened an issue that said, if you have a link and you drag it to the address bar, then the screen just go goes blank and then opens that link in an unescapable single full screen window. Does anyone know what that unescapable <laughs> single full screen window is? So the, in the, for a ref to give you context, they're talking about like, you know, they have uh, a web view and they have a link in it and they take that web view and they drag and drop it into the URL bar, expecting that will navigate the web view to the URL they're going to. But that's not what happens. What happens is that the link gets opened in the browser window, right? So they've basically dragged a link from the web view process into the parent renderer process, which has a higher privilege level. And at this point in time did not have sandboxing. So this is what I call drag and drop privilege escalation. Uh, you take a link, you drag it, oh wow, now it's in a new process with higher privileges and it can uh, call node functions and write to your file system and et cetera. And I actually wrote a demo page for this, which no longer works in Brave, but basically you drag and drop a link and suddenly like the page has written a file on your file system, which is ex quite surprising behavior. So the fix was that for that was pretty simple. Basically in the main window, which is the main browser window, we say uh, we can only load whitelisted URLs, which are you know the trusted content. Just don't load arbitrary URLs in there. Another fun issue we ran into was using two different URL parsers in the same application. I'm pointing this out because I think um, a lot of applications do this in Electron without being aware of it. Um, so consider this URL. What do you think the host name is? Someone shout out a suggestion. All right, so how many people think it's codefoo.org? All right, uh, how many people think it's brave.com? A couple, okay, most of you think it's codefoo.org, but there's some uncertainty in the room. So if you use notes built in URL module, um, just require URL or something, and you do URL.parse, it thinks the host name is brave.com, which is not what the majority of you guys thought. Um, it turns out you guys were right, the, that the host name should not be brave.com, but node's URL parser is not standards compliant. <laughs> 
So Chrome's URL parser, which you can get to from the window DOM context using the window.url object, is correct in that it thinks uh, the host name is brave.randomgarbage.subdomain.codefoo.org. But what's interesting is these two don't agree, and you might ask, are there any security issues that can be caused by this discrepancy? And it turns out there is. Um, because previously, before we fixed this bug, what happened in Brave when you load this attacker-controlled domain is that we had a lot of Node non-render, uh, sorry, non-Chromium components in React, which would use this node call URL.pars to determine things like what site settings apply to the page, what's the origin of the page, and all of those functions would think that the origin was Brave.com. So, for instance. Um, we would get the site settings from brave.com from the state and apply those on what Chromium thought was codefoo.org. That sounds like bad news. So this is what would happen, right? You would go to this page, which is attacker controlled, and it shows a cute cat picture from codefoo.org because they have good taste in cats or something. But this is not what we, Brave the company, have put on our website. So it's not our domain. But on the other hand, um, you see this shield site settings panel thinks it's brave.com. And so it would apply to shield settings from brave.com. And that was a pretty major security issue for us. This was actually reported by someone named Matt Austin on a platform called HackerOne um, earlier last year. And uh, HackerOne, I wanted to give them a shout out because they've been really useful for us for getting these external bug reports. And if you want to talk to me after, I can talk a lot about running a bug bounty program. So the fix was pretty easy. Um, in Muon, we just exposed a URL parser, which does the correct thing and agrees with Chromium. But for other Electron apps, uh, if you're using URL.parse, I think you should use this new URL.URL node function, um, which is new as of node 7 for better, safer URL parsing. All right, so the third bug or set of bugs I want to point out is that uh, we don't actually have all the benefits of Chromium's TLS stack in Electron Muon. So when we first started using Electron, we were like, oh, well, use this the Chromium networking stack. So, you know, TLS will be exactly the same as in Chromium. And it turns out that's not exactly true. So one thing we found quite recently was that um, certificate pinning is disabled by default in non-Google Chrome builds of uh, Chromium, which Muon is not an official Google Chrome build, or Electron isn't either. So there's this flag, enable static pins, and it's set to false for Electron and Muon. Um, static pinning, just to give you an overview, is a mechanism for websites to tell the browser that they should only accept certain TLS certificates for connections to their site. And this means that if some random certificate authority is compromised or decides to misbehave and issues, um, issues a certificate for google.com, then Chrome still wouldn't accept that certificate because it's pinned the certificates that it expects. So these pinning entries are submitted manually by website owners to the maintainers of Chromium, and they're hard-coded in this very large JSON file in the Chromium source tree. Um, Brave was, we talked to Chromium about this and they said, please don't use our pin list because you, Brave, do not have a list of contacts for all these sites that want to be pinned. So if they update their pins, then their site would be totally unreachable in Brave and um, that would be a disaster. So it's basically they're saying it's not safe for us to pin sites that we can't control or directly contact. So instead, actually, my coworker Pranjal here, who's in the back, um, did this pull request where we just pin our own uh, domains, such as like the Brave update servers, et cetera. But just keeping in mind that, you know, certificate pinning does not work in Electron yet by default. Another fun bug is uh, if you go to the site revoke.badssl.com, it shows it loads okay in, uh, in Brave or in any Electron app on Linux, Windows, and OS X 10.11. On the other hand, if you go to 10.13, it says the site can be not be loaded due to a certificate error. And this error is also what you get in Firefox and Chrome and so forth. So 
that's kind of weird, right? Like we have certain platforms on Electron where certificate revocation doesn't seem to be working correctly. Why is that? Well, let's talk about what certificate revocation is. It, um, it's a process that's needed because sites SSL certificates sometimes get compromised. Who here remembers Heartbleed from 2014? Right, so Heartbleed was an awful bug that leaked a lot of people's uh, private, S well, could have leaked a lot of people's private SSL keys. So we had to assume a large number of SSL certificates were compromised. So those sites had to revoke their certificates so they would no longer be trusted by the browser. What's interesting is your website itself can't be used for sending revocation info because if its SSL cert is compromised, then any information from that website might be going through a man in the middle attacker. So man in the middle would just say, you know, so imagine you, you go to the website and you're like, oh, is the cert revo revoked? Well, a man in the middle could just forge a response that says the cert is not revoked and the browser would keep trusting that certificate. So browsers have to support these methods for out of band updates about whether a cert has been revoked. And there's two of them, there's OCSP and CRLs. OCSP is um, a way for browsers to ask a third party server is a if a certificate is valid. So basically you, you go to a site, the site gives you a certificate and uh, an endpoint for OCSP. Uh, you go to the OCSP endpoint and say, is the certificate valid? And then if it's valid, you connect to the site. If it's not valid, there's an error. So you can probably think of multiple ways this isn't optimal. Um, for one, you don't wanna block the connection to the website on this random third party responder um, because that'd be bad for performance. So because it's not blocking, then it's, uh, it's, so you have to wait until the site loads before you know whether the certificate is valid. Also, these checks are done over HTTP, not HTTPS, so that, uh, so an attacker, if they wanted to, could just block the OCSP responses. So browsers have mostly consensed that um, OCSP is fairly useless and it's being slowly deprecated. The alternative is CRLs and that's still used by Chrome and also by Firefox now. CRLs are basically these giant blacklists that certificate authorities maintain and also I guess some operating systems maintain them. And they say, these are all the certs that have been revoked, do not trust them anymore. Chrome uses a uh, thing called CRL sets, which are, is like a giant set of CRLs compiled from various sources. So basically um, you make a connection to the site, the browser checks its local store of blacklisted certificates to see if that certificate is on it. And if it is, then it shows a certificate error. And this is much more performant and secure. It turns out that Chromium embedders such as Muon and Electron do not have access to Chrome CRL sets by default. Uh, they cited some complicated reasons for this, but I'm talking to Chrome and trying to get them to fix this. Because without CRL sets and without OCSP, then there's actually no way for us to know if a certificate is revoked. So we delegate that decision to the operating system. And that's why you, you saw a difference earlier um, on the slide between Mac OS 10.11 and 10.13 is in 10.13, the operating system, this certificate is uh, known to be revoked in a way that Chrome slash Muon slash Electron can understand. So, but, but currently we're not in a very good state because if Heartbleed happens again tomorrow, then we either have to wait for operating systems to ship certificate revocation updates or we, like every Electron app would separately have to ship a software update. So, you know, like uh, Slack updates, et cetera, Brave updates. So it would be really, really good in the future if we had a certificate revocation mechanism built into Electron. But, you know, the response to all of this could be that Electron isn't meant for loading remote content. It's not designed to be a web browser. The problem is that developers routinely ignore this advice. Um, this is Mist, which is one of the Ethereum project's official Ethereum wallets. It is an Electron app. It does load ethereum.org and I think etherscan.io inside uh, a web view. But it's on Chromium 58 and it's not sandboxed. 
And as you can see, once you go to ethereum.org, you, you can use it as a browser. Like you can navigate to Twitter and GitHub, et cetera. You know, you can log into Twitter and then you can go to any website. So even though it's not designed to be a browser, people are going to navigate to random websites inside it as if it were a browser. Chromium 58 came out in April of last year, by the way. So unsurprisingly, um, recently Mist had a security vulnerability alert. Uh, they didn't release details of this, but it was said to be due to a Chromium vulnerability. So basically this seems to be due to the fact that they're on a pretty old version of Chromium for which vulnerabilities are already public. And the impact is that malicious websites can potentially steal your private keys, which is pretty bad if you're rich on Ethereum. Um, yeah, so there's a blog post for this. And basically their advice kind of boils down. So they don't fix this. They just set an, they just show an alert in the app that says, please don't browse untrusted websites using Mist. But that's kind of faulty advice because, you know, even if you say don't browse untrusted websites and 100% of users follow those directions perfectly, it's still kind of fragile because if an attacker can get a cross-site scripting attack in a trusted website, then they basically can get to, you know, with little effort, get to app level system privileges due to the lack of sandboxing. So, yeah. So I don't think I I don't think it's enough to just say don't browse untrusted websites um, when in your app it's possible to go to many untrusted websites. So key takeaways here, just to summarize that if you're thinking about security, Electron is not the same as Chromium. Um, there's sandboxing differences. Uh, Electron used to be behind on Chromium security updates, but I think they've been doing a lot better with that recently, um, as long as your app keeps up to date. Uh, tr you can drag and drop across privilege boundaries. Um, you, are, you have two different URL parsers, beware of that. And a certificate of revocation and pinning don't work the same as in Chrome. And you can say, you know, but the threat models are different. But in reality, I kind of question whether that's valid because, uh, you know, electronic threat model is that developers should only trust, uh, only load local and or trusted content. Um, that's that's easy to say, but in reality, because Electron is so easy to use, it's very easy to load untrusted content and many apps end up doing it. Um, and even if you have trusted content that accepts user input, you know, there's script injections, cross-site scripting attacks, et cetera, to worry about. So the line between trusted and untrusted web content, I think is a lot thinner than most people think it is. Um, and the default privilege for content is YOLO because there's no sandboxing. And that is regardless of whether it's trusted or not. So my, my thoughts on this are Electron should either migrate to secure defaults, which there has been some discussion about in this, uh, in this issue and possibly others. Um, so maybe instead of enabling a full sandbox as the default, you can find some way to enable partial sandbox just for content that is marked as untrusted. Um, another option which I thought of while looking at MIST was um, maybe there should be an API for apps to specify what origins are trusted um, and untrusted. So for instance, if ethereum.org is trusted, then by default, you shouldn't be able to navigate outside of ethereum.org in that unsandbox context. So Chromium has this thing um, for extensions called a content security policy, which kind of restricts what origins and types of content can be loaded. And maybe Electron should require apps to have that by default in like some kind of manifest file. Anyway, that's all I had. Um, yes, we're hiring. So, thanks. That was some really awesome stuff. I'm mostly excited, by the way, that Electron 2.0 is going to have like a bunch of default warnings that you're going to see. You're going to curse me mostly because I put those in there. But many of the things that Jan pointed out, you're going to now get barked at by Electron for. Um, yeah. Um, does anybody, I don't, Jan, do you want to take any questions or like rather not? Yeah. Yeah. Like definitely. Like, I mean, does anybody have any questions? Yeah. So our goal is, so Tor Browser, uh, I used to 
tangentially kind of work on tour. And it is a very complicated and hard to maintain thing that has all kinds of leaks all the time. So I think it would be really irresponsible for us to say this is a drop in replacement for Tor browser within like without the years of effort that have gone into testing and leak proofing it. So our thoughts on this are it'd be nice to release something that would actually be usable um, side by side with your regular browsing. Um, for instance, if you just want to hide a, a single website's browsing from your local network and from your ISP, then a Tor tab could do this. So it, it's going to be like tabs within the same window that are using Tor as the network proxy. Any other questions? Uh, so no, note's response to this is that, uh, where is this to refer to? Yeah, so the, the URL, so node require url.pars is still, uh, still has this issue, but there is advice is to use this new API URL dot, I guess you yell at URL <laughs> instead of that, so, so yeah. Yeah, just go, just go down one level. <laughs> yeah. That's a good question. So I, I think extensions are a bad idea from a security perspective because instead of auditing your own code, you have to audit a bunch of random people's code as well. Um, that's why, largely why in Brave, we've been really reluctant to allow people to load any extensions that aren't super trusted, like one password. Um, in the future, we can consider, in the, I think we're considering making it easier for people to load extensions, but it's not a super high priority. Yeah. Yeah, we do have MetaMask. Well, MetaMask is also off by default. So most of our extensions are like, you know, you have to opt in and be aware of any potential security risk. Uh, but yeah, we, we actually are in contact with the MetaMask people and you know, give me, gives me some confidence that we can just call them if there's a security issue. Yeah. Yeah. All right, cool. So I think we're gonna take a break, but before we do that, um, next speaker is gonna be Zeke here from the Electron team. I'm very excited about all the way from Moorpark and uh, I wanted to tell you about like Zeke and what he's up to, but um, it's much more exciting to talk about Moorpark because I checked out the Wikipedia article and it has three cool facts about it. Number one, it is, has one of the few colleges that have an exotic animal training center, which is cool. And then the two more things that Wikipedia has to say about your city are number one, once they had this drama where like a Siberian tiger escaped and they had to shoot it, which was like a big thing. But according to the Wikipedia article, it was fine because just a month later, they found like a skeleton of an ancient mammoth. <laughs> anyway, Zeke is going to talk about it. <laughs> Not really, I'm joking. Um, but I think we should take like a 10 minute break um, and then we're going to hear Zeke talk and I'm very excited about it. Also, thank you, Jan. Thank you so much. Oh, you did message me on Twitter. All right, cool. Yeah, sorry. Now I'm just hearing out. Yes. Uh, no, I remember.
Yeah, 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 yeah. I mean, um, yeah.
All right, all right. Took me just about 20 minutes to figure out how to connect HDMI to USB-C, but I figured it out, it's fine. Definitely not bitter about losing all the ports. Totally cool that MacBooks now don't have HDMI because I just... who needs it? Who needs HDMI? Completely outdated. Anyway, I'm just going to give it over to Zeke, who's great. So please give it up for Zeke, everyone. Hello. Wow. It works. So thanks for having me here, Felix. I'm really happy to be here and happy with the turnout. Thanks, everyone, for coming. Um, my name is Zeke. I work at GitHub. I'm uh, I'm on the Electron team. Um, we're mostly remote team. I think no two members live in the same city. Zeke, Zeke I'm very sorry. I got to interrupt you real quick. Run over there and turn off the music. Sure thing. No music for this presentation, so I guess. So I'm going to be talking about um, the maintainer group, the people that actually maintain Electron um, day to day and kind of how we operate and how we keep the project healthy. Um, so if you were here to learn specifically about Electron app development, there's a little bit for you at the end, but mostly um, this is more about kind of how to run an open source project. So um, the GitHub Electron team is seven people. Um, some of us are pretty new. Um, I've been on the team for about two years. Jacob Groundwater is also here with us somewhere. Jacob, are you in the room? Maybe Jacob bailed, but he, he, he should be around somewhere. <laughs> um, we also have people from Slack who are part of our maintainers group. Of course, Felix, uh, Matt Crocker, who wins the prize for really cool avatar. Um, and some other people like Natish, who's also here. Where's Natish, raise your hand. All right. So if you want uh, Slack electron expertise, now you kind of know who to go to in the room. Uh, and then, so Slack's kind of been with Electron for a long time good buddies for years now. But more recently, Microsoft has really kind of invested in Electron. So uh, Skype is an Electron app, uh, Visual Studio Code, um, and they're coming out with more and more apps based on Electron. So they're, they're pretty invested at this point in the success of Electron. Um, so there's actually now a, a Microsoft team um, that works entirely on Electron. And this has been such a good thing for um, the health of the project overall. Um, GitHub is, or Microsoft is very concerned about security. Um, and a lot of things that Jan was talking about in her talk are, um, you know, really important things to, to Microsoft. So they're, they're kind of pushing the way uh, forward on keeping Chromium up to date in Electron. Um, and that's been their main, their main focus is like, when new versions of Chromium come, come out, let's Let's stay on the ball so we can actually get uh, the Electron release cadence more in line with, with Chromium because uh, the the fast, like the, the healthiest path to security is actually just continually updating and staying as close to Chrome versions as you can because that's where most of the vulnerabilities come from. So this group uh, of Microsoft people, they're on our call every single week. Um, so we have very close connections with them. So the project has really grown beyond GitHub. Like it was started at GitHub, but now there are all these big companies investing in it. So um, the health of the project is, you know, I'm feeling optimistic about Electron's future based on this investment from these companies. 
So there are also just lots of other people working on it. It's not just these big companies. There are lots of little app developers uh, helping keep Electron alive and well. Um, so I want to just talk a little bit about the workflows that we use, um, mostly on GitHub. So if you haven't seen this page on github.com, it's a, I think it was um, released in the last few months. It's just a community checklist where you can make sure that your project is actually adhering to some standards that make it welcoming to to contributors like you know having a having a readme having a code of conduct um having a contributing guide so literally documentation on how to participate in the project having a license and issue templates so we took a long time to actually start using issue templates on the electron project but when we did it was like it, it was such a huge win um, and it, all we had to do was like write a markdown file and commit it to our repository so here's an example of an issue template um, now that, you know, an issue that was created using the template now that we have it. So when someone comes to like triage this issue or try to solve it, it's actually like really straightforward. There's like a reproduction case and you can see what the expected behavior is and the actual behavior. Um, so if you're maintaining a project, this is like really low hanging fruit to make it easier for people to help out. Um, so another thing that we do, we have like 150 people in the maintainers group who um, have right access to every repository, every public repository in the Electron organization, which is seems a little bit dangerous. Um, but the the idea behind it is that we want everyone who who joins uh, the the group to feel, you know, like an owner of the project. So anyone can create new repositories. They can create branches on existing repositories. So rather, if you want to contribute to our Electron and you're in this maintainers group, you don't have to fork Electron and open PRs from your branches and everything like that. You can just create your own branches right on Electron. So um, we've worked really hard to come up with a model that keeps people outside of GitHub feeling as included in the project and as, as flexible as possible. So we also use branch protection on, on um, all our repos. So this is sort of the way that we make sure that yes, even though everyone has like keys to do all kinds of stuff, they can't actually do anything super dangerous, like release a new version of Electron accidentally or something like that. So um, GitHub has all these really incredible granular features for like controlling which branches can be pushed to by whom and things like that. So we have tons of bots too on the Electron org. Um, so some of these are pretty experimental. Um, CI reporter is actually super useful. It's kind of a new thing, but um, if someone opens a pull request and the CI fails for whatever reason, this bot will actually find the failing message within the, the CI output and comment on the issue saying, you know, this happened, which normally that's the job of like a maintainer of a project to be like, oh, okay, so this didn't pass. And this, this, this person who submitted this PR doesn't necessarily know to come back and look at the issue and see that the CI failed. So it's just automating away something that humans shouldn't necessarily have to do. Um, so other ones like WIP is literally just a tiny little access like status check that says if WIP is in the title of the PR, then it shouldn't be mergeable yet. So it's kind of like taking these conventions that people have created on GitHub and sort of like solidifying into, into something real. Um, Access lint is really cool. It's we use it on the website and it's just this bot that makes sure that PRs don't introduce uh, you know HTML that is not taking accessibility into account. So this is again like important stuff, but it's easy for humans to miss. So it's good to have bots in place for all this. We use Greenkeeper all over the place. Greenkeeper is a GitHub app that monitors your uh, projects. Um, dependencies and opens pull requests automatically when new versions of those dependencies come out. So we have this all over the place. Again, uh, fewer bottlenecks, fewer humans having to do tedious work. So last week, this is a kind of a shameless plug, but I created this new bot called Release Notifier. And the, the idea is that um, you know, a lot of people will open a pull request, especially on Electron, and sometimes it takes a while before it actually lands in a release. It might be a month. So people comment on the issue saying like, which version did this come out in? Is this in Electron yet? And so this bot exists now to kind of solve that problem. So 
Um, in theory, we could also do it on issues too. So right now it just comments on pull requests, but if the pull request is tied to an issue, we could actually comment on the issue as well. So everyone subscribed would, would get that notification. So a lot of the, the apps that I showed on that previous screen were made with this uh, project called ProBot. Uh, it's an entirely open source project created by GitHub where um, you basically have access to web hooks um, on all events on, a, on GitHub, like um, scoped to an organization or a specific repository. And ProBot is like, uh, on any event, you're, you run this ProBot server and on any event, um, you, your event handler is given a GitHub API client that's already authenticated and has full access to do anything you want on GitHub. So it's basically this very lean and responsive robot that can react to any activity on GitHub and do all kinds of things like open comments or you know merge pull requests or uh, tell people that they're using offensive language or all kinds of things. So we we use ProBot like all over the place on Electron and it's becoming more and more uh, an important part of our, our process. So also semantic release is something that we've embraced. Like um, we were kind of, in general, the team was a little bit skeptical about this idea, but once we actually started using it on a few projects, we realized that it was really valuable. So the idea behind semantic release is um, you enforce a commit message convention when using Git. So people have to uh, use some kind of prefix when they're committing uh, changes to the repository. So like uh, the, the basic ones are fix, feature, which is just F-E-A-T, or breaking change. And the idea here is like, um, whenever a change lands in your project in a release, excuse me, a, a, re a release should just happen automatically without human intervention based on changes just being shipped. So based on uh, the semantic meaning of these commit messages, um, semantic release just knows whether to do a major minor or patch bump on your on your project. So it uses um, Travis by default, but it, it works with other CI providers as well. So the gist here is um, using our workflow where any maintainer is also um, you know, has right access to everything. Um, we can actually set up a flow where um, no humans are blocking the process of something actually being deployed into production, um, either as part of Electron project itself or the Electron websites or all the, the website or all these constituent piece modules that, that make up the Electron ecosystem. So we haven't rolled this out on Electron yet, but um, it's in the works. So uh, this is how this, this little slide is just how you would set up um, semantic release on your project. And if you're an open open source maintainer, this will change your life. A lot, a lot less grunt work. So here's an example of like um, oh, one of the things that people worry about when like starting to use semantic release is um, they don't want to have to enforce their like uh, a rule on people who are making contributions. So as a maintainer, you can actually do like a merge commit or a squash commit when merging a PR and you're at your own prefix. So you don't have to make your contributors like follow your specific rules. They can still write commit messages however they want and you can write your own when you merge PRs. So I'm just gonna talk a little bit about um, stuff that's coming in Electron uh, or that's happening right now. So at Microsoft's urging, which was I think prudent, um, we're gonna start following semantic versioning. So in the past, you've, if, if you've used Electron before, you know the versioning system was kind of willy-nilly. So like, you know, 1.5 would be one version of Chromium and 1.6 would be another version of Chromium and the one isn't moving. So we didn't really follow Semver. So it was sort of like, there was no clear versioning system. Um, moving forward, starting with 2.0, we're actually gonna be making an attempt to follow semantic versioning. So, um, the numbers is probably, if you're familiar with like, you know, a, a lot of projects have had to kind of like bite the bullet on this, like React at one point went from 0 0.14 to 15.0 or something like that. So this is this is kind of that same moment for Electron. So 2.0 will be the beginning of the major versions of Electron moving, you know, incrementing a lot faster. So Electron 2, we might get a beta out this week. Uh, 
we're so, so close. Uh, Electron 2 is going to have chromium 62 in it, um, probably. Might be 61, not entirely sure. Um, but to illustrate here, Electron 3 will probably be 63, chrome 63. Um, but if we did like a major version bump of node, that would also be a major version bump of Electron. So the numbers are going to go up faster, but you'll actually be able to like derive some meaning from the, the numbers moving forward. So in November, we launched our localized website, which is now written in Node, and we've seen a lot more contributions from people because the previous website was uh, written in Jekyll, and we sort of got as much out of out of it as we could until we finally had to rewrite the thing in Node. But we're using this translate this localization platform called CrowdIn, which is really awesome. It's like a it's a tool that uh, integrates with GitHub and allows people to do collaborative translation on your documentation and automatically generates pull requests to GitHub. Um, so it's pretty slick. Um, in the time since we launched in November, so fewer than three months, 500 people have just organically jumped in and translated content into 23 or maybe even now 24 languages. So this is going pretty smoothly. Um, shout out to Wande in the audience there who is uh, one of our localization proofreaders. Um, it's really good to have you here. Um, we have all these localization people, you know, translators all over the world, and it's it's nice to actually you know meet some of these people in real life and see that they're human. Um, so the Node.js project last week, or maybe the week before, just announced they're actually going to adopt the model that we used for um, localizing Node's documentation as well. So they're going to be using CrowdIn. They're going to use a, a similar flow for like taking content out of the node repo, the docs, and moving it onto the, the node website. So this is good for Electron because now we have like someone else who has the same, you know, a much bigger project that has is going to have some of the same um, challenges. So we can we can we're basically like attaching onto the node community and we can share a lot of this this work together. So here's the progress on translation so far. It's been really remarkable people just jumping in from random places. Um, and yeah, there's just hundreds of translations pouring in every day. It's really cool. Um, Electron app registry. So today, if you go to electronjs.org and you look at apps, it's not a place that you go to be like, ooh, where's that cool app that I need? Like, it's not, it's not an app store. It's like sort of a, a proof that the Electron apps do actually exist, but it doesn't really like fulfill a need to like find desktop apps. However, there are probably by now 30,000 GitHub repos that depend on Electron. And I think maybe 22,000 of those are non-forks. So um, there's a lot of really good stuff in there and it's all about like discovering it. Um, so I think it's our job, GitHub's job to like surface this and make it more obvious to people like what's out there, what apps exist already. Um, Let's not try to like solve problems that have already been solved by existing apps. Um, also, we constantly get people saying like, I have this cool Electron app, like, can you put it on the homepage? And we sort of did that for like a year or so. And then, you know, it's not, that's not a sustainable thing and we don't want to play favorites. So we're kind of rolling out this new idea of like, let's feature apps by numerous different criteria um, so that every app gets a chance to like have its day on the sun on the website. So a lot of this stuff is kind of already built. Some of it is in the works. Um, and of course, all of this is open source. So if any of you are interested in participating or commenting, please do. Um, other things in the works. Uh, so people like Felix are contributing really incredible documentation to Electron right now. Like Felix just added this security checklist that's like 20 items that is like just this huge laundry list of things that you need to be aware of, or maybe you don't need to be aware of them, but you need to be aware, like if, if you're changing some settings, you should be aware of the implications. Um, so we have lots of this really useful documentation, but it's not particularly structured. So something that's gonna come to the website is like just a, a, a way for people to go, you know, page zero, how do I set up my development environment? How do I install Electron? How do I create an app? What are my options for like actually packaging apps and deploying them like that? So um, that's that's something our team is going to be working on. Also, if you've ever tried to set up auto updating with Electron before, it's like pretty 
not that fun. Um, but a, a new update just came out to this thing called Squirrel, which is sort of like the, the internal thing that manages uh, pinging the mothership to see if there's a new version of your app available. That's actually been updated to now not require you to run your own server, just to like your own web server, just to, to hand out those updates. So auto updating apps, that's going to be easier. If you've already done it, then you already went over, you already went through the work. But if you haven't yet, it's probably going to be pretty easy in the future. Um, and then, like I said, semantic re releases of Electron are coming soon. So we're trying to remove like anywhere where we can remove like um, humans from the equation. That's that's what we're trying to do, just to keep things flowing smoothly. Um, that's all I got. Just wanted to say, uh, this slide deck was created with MARP, which is this cool little Electron app for making slide deck decks out of Markdown files. Um, and if if you've heard of Electron Forge, you've probably heard of Electron Forge before, but it, you may not have known that it has this install command, which actually, you know, if you're if you don't want to touch your trackpad or your mouse, you can actually like install electron apps right from github with this with this cli so this is like username repository and as long as uh it works on windows and mac and stuff so as long as that app has like release assets assets on github like dmgs or zips or exes or whatever kind of like a homebrew for electron apps so that's all i got thank you zeke are we taking questions uh, I think we should actually. I have one with the audience uh, for documentation purposes. How many of you have heard of Electron Forge? That is not as many as I wanted to. Oh. Mm, how many of you have heard of Electron Builder? The same people. <laughs> same. Hmm. How many of you are human? Okay, so yeah. <laughs> same, same people, surprisingly. <laughs> um, yeah, and any questions for Zeke? Ole, over, ole. So the question is, as, as a newcomer trying to build an app, should I use Electron Forge or Electron Builder? And this is a this is a question that a lot of people face and it's actually not a binary. So it's not necessarily those two things. You can also just kind of roll your own, um, which a lot of apps do. So Electron Builder is, is a tool that kind of has um, a lot of baked in conventions. So if you're familiar with like the Ruby on Rails ideology, convention over configuration. So instead of you having your own home baked idea of where you put your files, you actually just follow the convention that's outlined for you by Electron Builder. You have a two package. You have two two package JSON structure. So at the top level of your project live your dev dependencies, and then within that you have a directory which is your app, which contains the runtime dependencies. So you you kind of use these two different package JSONs to, dif to specify different parts of your project, and it has it's definitely like the batteries included tool for packaging your applications for Mac, Windows, and Linux. Electron Builder is attractive to many people because it's straightforward and you don't have to do very much configuration as long as you just read the readme and follow the steps you'll be okay electron forge is a little different in that it's um it can be somewhat batteries included but it also allows you to kind of um make your own way so when you create an app with Electron Forge, it makes some opinionated choices for you about the dependencies it uses, but also makes it easy for you to change to swap out pieces of that as well. So if you want to depart from the batteries included model and kind of roll your own thing for part of it, Electron Forge makes that a lot easier. And Electron Forge is trying to have as little surface area as possible and focusing on using vetted user land modules that solve each of the different problems of packaging for all the different so they're both great. Um, we at GitHub on the Electron team have been kind of reluctant to play favorites, um, especially the whole of NPM user land is, is about choice, right? There's like 20 different modules to solve each problem that, that, that you may be facing. So um, 
on the one hand, it's nice to have the choice. On the other hand, it's 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 tough to if you don't know which one to use to actually diagnose and figure out which one to use. So any thoughts on that, Felix? So just speaking for myself, myself only, not for the electron maintainers, not for Slack, not for anyone. I have gone on record before and said that I prefer Electron Forge. And I prefer it for one and one reason only, which is that at the beginning of time, when we all thought about building apps, uh, we all went out and built our own build pipelines. And at one of the first maintainer summits, we sat down and were like, gee, we all spend like all this time setting up our own build pipelines. Wouldn't it be nice if we like turned that into one, you know, one holistic set of build stacks? And uh, the one thing all the big apps have in common, Slack, Visual Studio Code, all of those, are that we all use the same building blocks. Something like Electron Packager, which creates, you know, a package, something like Electron Windows Store, which creates a Windows Store edition. Um, there's, there's all these modules that the community shares, even the ones that don't use kind of holistic build pipeline. Electron Forge uses those packages unmodified, meaning that they have a fairly high uh, percentage of code that has been vetted and approved and is being used by the people who also maintain Electron, which to me is um, an extremely good thing. Um, we had a canonical summit a few weeks ago, and um, both the maintainer from Electron Builder as well as the maintainer from Electron Forge were there, and we talked about unrelated Linux things. But one of the ways we talked about it were like these these philosophies around batteries included. And um, just to give you like the quick example, how do you build something if you can't build it on the current platform? Electron Builder will take a source code and send it to a server. Electron Forge will error. I am extremely uncomfortable with anyone sending my source code anywhere without asking. On the other hand, I can see why people just want this stuff to be built. But um, as an individual, I would recommend everyone uses Forge. It sets you up for greater success should your app actually explode and at one point you want to do something custom to your build pipeline. Any other questions? Potentially. Yeah, so if we end up actually using semantic release on electron electron, then every time a pull request lands, depending on the semantics of the, the commit messages within that pull request, it would trigger a release. Yeah, so you'd actually see a release go out on every single landed pull request. Yeah, so the question was, does the CI have the permission to create uh, a, a release in the electron source? Yeah, and so the CI, you're basically giving your CI a GitHub token and an NPM token if you're publishing to NPM as well. Creates a GitHub release and a tag and publishes to NPM. So currently, we don't, we do, we don't do a release with every PR by any stretch of the imagination. Uh, there's no exact science to it. We just kind of cut releases as best we can when the time seems right. But we do, we want to get away from that, and we want to we want to have a much faster release cadence. I think that's it on questions. Feel free to ask me in person. Yeah. Cool. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank See. you. <clears throat> Uh, a few closing remarks. First of all, thank you all for coming by. Um, we're just going to hang out, or at least I'm just going to hang out until 9, just because, you know, most of the time people, like, hang out and have some questions and stuff. At 9, I'm going to go home, and uh, at that point, I will kick you out. Fair warning, it's going to happen. But until then, please feel free to drink all our alcohol.